of all of history, where it's when Jesus Christ died on that cross. And when Christ died on the cross, the lightning flashed, the thunder roared, the darkness came, as the nails had gone into the hands of Christ and a spear had gone into his side and the nails through his feet. And Jesus was hanging between heaven and earth, suffering for us. The soldiers had taken him out of his prison and they'd put a crimson robe on him. They'd beaten him two or three times. And then they took two or three murderers with him, two of them in particular who were going to be crucified with him. And then they took him across Jerusalem and they made each one of them bear a placard or at least a herald went before them to bear a placard telling of their crimes. And then Jesus stumbled and fell. He was weak from the loss of blood and they compelled an African to help him carry his cross. And as long as the history of man shall go, we will always remember that it was an African that helped Jesus bear his cross. There are people today that say that Christianity is the white man's religion. Don't you believe it? For all of those who believe in Jesus Christ he belongs to all people. He came from that part of the world that touches Asia, Africa, and Europe. He belongs as much to the African as he does to the European, and as much to the European as he does to the Asian. Jesus Christ belongs to all people, but an African helped him carry his cross. And then when they got to Golgotha, these soldiers went about their work, nailing the nails in. These two murderers and thieves that were being crucified with Jesus were yelling, screaming, crying. But Jesus never uttered a word. And they took some medicated wine that acted as a sedative and gave it to the two thieves and they took it and they offered it to Jesus and he refused it because he wanted to drink the very bitter dregs of death in our place for us. He wanted to suffer all of death, showing that God loved the world and God was willing to forgive the sins of the world because of what Christ was doing on that cross. The people that were watching were laughing and sneering. They said, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Come on, you worked great miracles. Why don't you work one more? You raised Lazarus from the dead. You raised a widow's son from the dead. Why can't you save yourself? Those blind people did not realize that God had foreordained and predetermined that Jesus Christ was to die the death of the cross and it was only through that death that the world could find forgiveness and salvation. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Apostle Paul was an intellectual, one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. And Paul went to Corinth, pagan, intellectual, immoral Corinth, the university center of the ancient world. And Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why did Paul say that? He said that because God has locked up in the cross the secret of the universe. The only way that earth can ever find reconciliation with heaven is by way of the cross. The only way that you can ever get to heaven is by way of the cross. And if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross, you could have never had sin forgiven. You could have never gone to heaven. And the problems of earth would have never had a solution. Only by the way of the cross can we find our way back to God. And that's why it was important that Jesus stay on 
the cross. Because you see, man is in rebellion against God. Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden. And every man since Adam and Eve has broken God's law and sinned against God. And as a result of that, God and man are separated. And man's only way back to God is through Jesus Christ. Man had broken the law. Man deserved death. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. But God said, wait a minute. I'll give my son. I'll let him die. I'll let him take the judgment and the hell for you. And if you will put your trust and your faith in my son, I will forgive your sin. I will change your life. I will give you an inner peace and joy and satisfaction that you would never find in any other way. So Jesus was dying on that cross for your sin and your sin. Some people say, why don't you try to make your gospel relevant? The most relevant message in the world tonight is the fact that Christ died for you. He died in your place. He shed his blood for you. And without that experience, no one can get to heaven. Yes, Jesus Christ died and the people laughed and sneered. And two people that sneered and laughed the most were these two thieves and murderers that were dying with him. They were both mocking him, but one of them became strangely silent. And finally this one that was silent turned and rebuked the other thief in the air of the murderer and said, we're dying justly. We deserve to be crucified. But not this man in the middle. He's a good man. He's the son of God. Then he turned to him and asked him what seemed to be an improbable, an impossible question. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Will you remember me, Lord? And then Jesus gave one of the most astounding answers in the history of the world. The angels in heaven must have been shaken and startled and amazed when they heard what Jesus answered. Jesus said, Today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Think of it. Here was a thief, a murderer, a man that had committed every crime in the book dying, turns to Jesus in his dying moment and says, Lord, remember me. He didn't even say, forgive me. He didn't even say, Lord, take me to heaven with you. He didn't say, Lord, prefer me. He just said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus answered quick as a flash and said, today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And to all of you people that think you can't be converted in a moment and that you cannot be saved at this hour and at this moment in this rain in Baton Rouge and have your whole life transformed, you read the stories of the New Testament and the encounters that people had with Jesus. There are many of you that came here tonight in this rain that never dreamed that you were going to meet Jesus. You came out of curiosity or you came because your bus was already on the way or you had already promised some friends to come or you're a student here at the university and you came out of curiosity. Many of the people of the New Testament that came to Jesus never planned it. They never thought that they would have their lives changed. This thief on the cross that had been in prison knew that he was going to die on a cross. He knew he deserved it. He never dreamed that before the night came, that day, he would be in heaven. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. I'm going to see that man in heaven someday by the grace of God. He wasn't saved by his good works. He didn't even have time to be baptized. 
He didn't have time for anything. But he's in heaven. That's the grace and the mercy of God. And I want to tell you that the greatest word in all the language of men is forgiveness. That day, Jesus forgave him of every sin he had ever committed. Wiped the slate clean. And he was in heaven. There are three things about this passage. The whole gospel is in it. There's repentance. It's the only deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. I don't know what led this fellow to ask that question or to make that statement. It might have been the prayer that Jesus had just prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It might have been what Jesus had said to John concerning his mother. I don't know what it is or what it was, but the Holy Spirit used it. The Holy Spirit used it to convict him and to convince him that he needed Jesus and he repented of his sins at that moment and he was saved. I can imagine the other thief saying, why, what have you done? Have you turned preacher or something? You remember we strangled that old merchant for his gold? Remember you kidnapped that little child? Remember that girl you raped? Remember that person you slew? You think God's going to forgive you? Are you turn a preacher? He can't forgive you. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care how deep in sin you've gone. I don't care what you've done. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can make you a new person tonight if you put your faith and your trust in him. Yes, he repented. And the second thing he did was to believe. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. The scripture says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just repent and believe, and then you'll be saved. He said, when thou comest into thy kingdom, as though he were thinking of some far off kingdom age somewhere. And Jesus answered and said, today, right now, you'll be saved. Right now, you can have eternal life. You can put your trust and your confidence in Christ now. And he did. And that day, he went to paradise. Now, it's the word remember that I want you to think about a moment. He said, Lord, remember me. Did you know that God forgets? Did you know that there's a scripture in Jeremiah 31, 34 that says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more? God can forget. God can forget your sins. What does God forget? God never forgets the universe. He sends the rain. Yes, sir. God sends the rain. But the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun comes upon the just and the unjust. God blesses all of us with all of his blessings. He never forgets. Suppose he forgot the sun rain. Suppose the sun ceased to shine. The earth would turn into a glacier. Suppose God would forget because the scripture says that God holds the whole universe together. And if God ever took his hand off, it would blow to pieces. And then the scripture says that God remembers you. Tonight, I had in my little office here where I see people, a lady and her children and a mother and their son and their husband is a prisoner in North Vietnam. I don't think any of us will ever know what these families have suffered. I don't think any of us will ever know what those boys out there have probably gone through psychologically and physically, never knowing. And then we had another one come and see us tonight and her husband, she's just found out, is, a, is alive and a prisoner, but for a long time she didn't know. He was only missing an action. But let me tell you this, God remembers them. And when we bowed our heads in the little office and prayed, 
that God would remember them and that his grace and his love would reach out to North Vietnam to the prison camp and touch them. God remembers them and God answers prayer. How many times has God been with you? You don't even know. Because you see, you almost had a wreck the other day. But you were saved from it. Why? When you get to heaven, you may find out why. It might have been divine intervention. And that happens to all of us. God remembers you. And then God never forgets our sins either. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says, God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible says, for God shall bring every work into judgment. God is going to judge every sin that's ever been committed. What is your sin that so easily besets you? It's going to be brought to light, all the secret things. God is going to judge it. God never forgets sin. No sin has ever been forgotten by God. God has recorded everything you've ever done and all the things you've ever thought from the time you were born till the time you die. It's all there. It's all in the record books, and God will never forget. Nothing is going to be forgotten. How do you stand before God? But there's one thing God can forget. He can forget sin because of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He hath made him to be sin for us. It says in Isaiah 53, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It says in 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. The scripture teaches that God can forget our sins because of Christ. The sin that would damn us, the sin that would send us to judgment, the sin that would send us to hell, God can forget. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says your sins are purged. In Isaiah 43, it says your sins are blotted out. In Psalm 103, it says your sins are put away. Isaiah 38 says your sins are put behind his back. And in Hebrews, it says God can remember your sin no more. Ladies and gentlemen, because Christ died, because he rose again, because of what he did, God cannot remember my sin. I've committed plenty of sin in my life. And even if I'd only committed one sin in my whole life, it's enough to cause me to go to the judgment and be lost. Because I could keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, and I'd be guilty of all. But God has forgotten my sin. He forgot every sin that I have ever committed. Everyone he has forgotten. He's the only person in the whole universe that can forget. He has the ability to forget. Has he forgotten your sin? Have you brought your sin and laid it at the feet of Jesus? What a night to give your life to Christ. You may never have another moment like this. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You've sat here for over two hours in the rain. Many of you are soaked all the way through. And you've done it because you want your sins forgiven, many of you, and others of you have sat here because you're praying for somebody that needs Christ. And this is your hour and your moment, and it may never come again like this. I'm going to ask you to do something that I saw people in London do. I saw people in San Diego do. I saw people in Pittsburgh do. I'm going to ask scores of you to get up out of your seat right now and come across this field in the rain and stand here and by coming say, I want Christ in my life. I want my sin forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I will not be at the judgment in that final day. I want my life transformed by the power of Christ. I'm going to ask you to come right now. Men, women, young people, God has spoken to you. You need Christ. And in a moment like this, you'll never forget. I met a missionary out 
in the Far East a few months ago said, I received Christ one of those nights at Wembley Stadium in the pouring rain in England and stood ankle deep in mud to find Christ and said, I thank God because if it hadn't been for the rain, I don't know whether I would have come that night or not. But he said there was something about the challenge of coming forward in the rain that challenged me and it changed my life. Yes, it's not easy to come, but Christ went to the cross for you. And many people are on the way now. You get up and come and make your commitment to Christ. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. to all of you that have come. You've come tonight to make your commitment to Christ because you want your sins forgiven. You want to know you're going to heaven. You want a new direction in your life. And you've come to make a commitment to Christ because you want him to forget your sin and save your soul. Well, I want to tell you, he remembers you and he loves you and he wants to forgive you. He loves you. Keep that in mind now that God loves you and is willing to forgive and forget all the past. And from tonight on, there are four things that are very important. First, read your Bible every day. We're going to give you a Gospel of John. We want you to read it several times before you read any other part of the Bible. We're going to give you a Bible study. We're going to give you some verses of Scripture to learn, memorize. This helps you to grow. Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, the scripture says. You cannot grow in the Christian life without reading and studying the scriptures every day. Secondly, pray. God will hear and answer your prayer. You're his child now. He loves you. Take every detail to God in prayer. He will answer your prayer. Don't let a day go by but what you spend a few minutes every morning, every evening, and all during the day in prayer and pray about everything whatever the details are nothing is too small to bring to god's attention and then thirdly witness for christ how do you witness you witness by the smile on your face you witness by the new attitude you have in the dormitory the new attitude you have toward work the new attitude you have in the home and then you witness by going to somebody of another race and going out of your way to be kind and courteous and gracious. And people will soon say, well, what's happened to you, Mary? And you can say, well, I've found Christ. He's changed my life. That's witnessing. And then fourthly, get into a church where Christ is preached and get to work for Christ. Get into the church and work in the church. You say, but I don't like to go to church. Jesus went to the churches of his day and they weren't all they were supposed to be but he did it to set us an example that we should go to church. Four things, read the Bible, pray, witness, and go to church. Now I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Oh God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I receive Christ as Savior. I confess him as Lord. From this moment on, I want to follow him and serve him in the fellowship of his church. In Christ's name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you.
If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. It's Anne. She's in trouble. If you don't take it to the edge every chance you get, you're dead already, baby. I was in trouble, and I didn't know what to do. Where are the Jews? I knew that I could take on the world. It's like you're in a dream, but not really a dream, this is a reality. I don't really believe in all this, but I know something crazy is happening right now. Tonight, I'm glad to tell you as we close that the Lord Jesus Christ can be received, your sins forgiven. The Billy Graham Library is a place for all walks of life. To recharge, reflect, renew your faith, and return again and again. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight I want you to turn with me to the 11th chapter of Matthew. The 11th chapter of Matthew. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to speak tonight on the university of life. I want to speak to young people as well as older people on the subject of the university of life. Now, we usually think of this text that a pastor will take and use at Labor Day. But that's wrong in one sense, and yet in another sense it is correct. But this is an invitation to men and women who are exhausted with the search for truth. Jesus said, you've been searching for truth, you're tired. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You found it. The search ends with me. Now, at this university we're talking about tonight, you can fail, but you can never drop out. All over the world, people are beginning to ask questions about where civilization is headed. One of the foreign experts left Washington in, his, in despair this past summer and went back to the university to teach, and he was asked why. And he said, sometimes I get the feeling I'm sitting on a hilltop watching two trains racing toward each other on the same track. Vice Premier Deng of China stated recently, this past summer, that World War III is inevitable and independent of man's will in this decade. A British editorial said recently, the world is on a collision course with disaster. Now, when we come back to America and see the affluence of America, I also read and hear about the new surge of problems that our affluency has created. Psychologists, economists, clergy, politicians are dealing with social and moral problems on a scale that they've never had to deal with before. For example, the marriage breakups, even among so-called professing Christians, some of them well-known Christians in our newspapers even today. Married women having adulterous affairs has tripled in the last five years, but the price they pay is escalating drug addiction, alcoholism, and suicide. Racial tensions, we thought the race problem in America was settled. It's not settled. Look at Miami or Philadelphia this past summer. The psalmist said, and I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and rest. Have you ever felt that way? You'd like to fly away from life and rest. You'd like to get out of that kitchen and rest. You'd like to get out of that job and rest. You'd like to fly away somewhere. Thousands of people out east come to Nevada and to California thinking that they're going to find it here. And they may find something here, but they find wonderful air here and 
Reno, I'll tell you that. They find beautiful mountains here. And they find a lot of activity here. But the real thing they're searching for is God. Because you see, they were made in the image of God. And without God, their hearts are restless till they come to know God. You can never find true rest until you know God. And you that are watching by television, if you want to find peace with God and rest in your own souls, call that number on your screen right now and let somebody talk to you, as many people here will do later on in the evening. You see, the psalmist longing to escape has become the cry of the world today. The psalmist also said, I'm full of heaviness and looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. The Bible also says, but the eyes of the wicked will fail and escape will elude them. Their hope will become a dying gasp. No way out. Jesus said, I am the way out. He said, there's only one way to escape, one way out, and I'm it. You have to come by the way of the cross and the empty tomb and find reconciliation with God and peace in your heart and joy in your heart that you have lost. And how many of you are trying to escape? You've come out here from somewhere else to escape all the rigors of life somewhere else, but you haven't really found it yet. You haven't found that joy and that peace that you thought you'd find or that sense of fulfillment. You don't have the answer to the questions, where did you come from? What is life all about? Where are you going when you die? You don't have those answers yet. You can find it tonight by coming to Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus said, learn of me it's a picture of jesus christ as the great professor at the university he's the greatest teacher that ever was the bible says he taught them as one having authority he spoke with authority you never find jesus saying i hope this is the way i think this is the way the bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto man but the end thereof are the ways of death there are many ways in life that seem right but the end is death destruction judgment and hell and jesus warned about that jesus said i am the way now most of the world would agree that he's the greatest teacher that ever lived and so tonight i want you to sit for a few moments at the feet of the world's greatest teacher in most american universities and colleges they have what is called required courses and elective courses now, in life, there are certain required courses. What are they? There are three. Three required courses and three elective courses that I want you to think about tonight. The first required course is life itself. Philosophy means the study of life and ideas concerning life. And one of the most discussed new books published last summer was The Philosophers, in which 20 of the most influential philosophers of the Western world in modern times are psychoanalyzed as to the amount of fulfillment that they themselves enjoy. And it, it, so dem it demonstrated that all 20 of them that they studied were characterized by loneliness and anxiety. You see, we did not choose to be born. We were not consulted about living. And there's nothing you can do to stop living. We did not choose where to be born. We did not choose what color of skin we have. There's no escaping life. Oh, you say, I can commit suicide. That doesn't get you out of life. You only kill the body. Your soul, your spirit is eternal. It lives on. So you cannot escape by suicide. Suicide does not end at all, as some people think. Yes, you're required to live. How do you face life? What resources do you have to call upon when the pressures get great and the crisis comes and the difficulties come? What do you have to call upon? Well, if you know Jesus Christ, you don't have anything to worry about because when he lives in your heart, he gives great inward peace and joy and assurance and a sense of safety and well-being when you come to Christ. It affects you physically and mentally and socially. Every way, every phase of your life is affected when Christ dominates your life because you let him come as Savior as well as Lord. And then the second required course that you have at the university, you're required to die. Now, we have been having a lot of studies on death lately. We read about Dr. Kubler-Ross and Dr. Rawlings and Dr. Moody and others and courses 
on thanatology and our universities are springing up all over the country teaching people about death and the classrooms are filled with students studying death. George Bernard Shaw said that there's one statistic that we can be sure of. Now, everybody in the gaming business here in Nevada ought to hear this. The odds against which no gambler can win, that one out of every one dies. Now, that's a sure thing. God said to Hezekiah, thou shalt die and not live. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. The Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die. The number of years is simply relative. The fact is we all die. And the Bible says there's a day, there's an hour, there's a minute already appointed for your death. It may be tonight. It may be tomorrow morning. There's a day, there's an hour, there's a minute already appointed. The Bible says in Job 14, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds beyond which he cannot pass. There's a moment beyond which you cannot live already upon. And God is giving you this moment of grace right now to find Christ as your Lord and your Savior. That's the reason the Bible always says today, 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 harden not your heart. Now is the accepted time of salvation. The Bible is saying don't put it off. Tomorrow is the devil's word. Come while you can. There's only one man in history that didn't have to die, and that was Jesus Christ. He said, no man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. He was perfect. He was free from sin and its effects, and yet he died on the cross. Why? Because he died for you. He took the things that caused death in your life on the cross in your place. He died for you. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. And now tonight, you come to that cross and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And God says, forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. I forgive you. I write your name in the book of life. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But not only did he die, he rose again. He's alive tonight. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. I haven't seen the picture, the raising of the Titanic, but I've read about it. And they're going to try to raise it next summer. And that's going to be a very interesting experiment. They're doing a similar thing off the coast of Japan where they found a, a Russian ship and they think it may have $30 billion worth of gold in it, and they're after that gold. And it's going to be quite interesting to see who gets it when they finally get it all up. And uh, so there is a great deal of raising going on, but the Bible says there's coming a time when there's going to be a general resurrection, when all of those that are lost are going to be raised, and all of those that are saved are going to be raised. And Jesus Christ died on our a count on the cross was raised again, and that is living proof. He is living proof tonight that there's going to be a resurrection someday. Think of it. Jesus Christ came back from the dead to tell us there's more. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. The Bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Are you ready? And then the third thing in this school that is required of you, the judgment of God is required. You're going to face the judgment. There's a movie out called The Judgment, and someday you're going to give a moral accounting. The searching eyes of God will miss nothing in that day when you stand before him. Now, the whole country's talking about who shot J.R. I'll tell you exactly who did it. A sinner. And someday, all the Ewing family and all the suspects are going to have to stand before God, just like you are. And every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account in the day of judgment, the Bible says. Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and Lord, we've done all these great things in your name. But the Bible says God is, Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. 
You see, you can be in the church. Last night, a number of Catholic people came forward and Episcopalian people and people who have confirmation. I was confirmed myself when I was about 12 years of age in a, an associate reformed Presbyterian church. And I know what they meant when they came. They wanted to reconfirm their confirmation. What had they promised God in accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? And how many of you tonight need Christ? You need to come to him. You've been away from him. You're in the church. Your name is on the church roll, but you really don't know Christ. More than a third of the people that have been coming forward here to receive Christ have no church connections, but nearly two-thirds do. Some of them are back east, and they haven't thought about the church since they've been in Reno or in Nevada or in Northern California or wherever you may be. Come to Christ tonight and receive him into your heart and start all over again. Now, those are the required courses. Life itself, you cannot be unborn. You're required to die. You're required to face the judgment. Now, there are certain options at the university tonight, the university of life. First, you can choose your way of life. The Bible says, choose you this day. As I said a moment ago, there is a way that seemeth right. Now, some of those roads that seem right, there's the lust of the eye the Bible talks about possessions it seems that to gain all the possessions you can there's nothing wrong with that it seems things are not wrong but when your life is centered in the acquisition of physical possessions then the lust of the eyes has gotten the best of you and that's sin and it seems right but it's wrong and it leads to a dead end then there's the lust of the flesh those are the physical things which offer by way of luxury and entertainment some of us are selling our souls for sinful pleasure. Overeating, the wrong use of sex, excessive use of alcohol, all of these things. The scripture says, the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Then there's also the pride of life. That seems right. Ego, position, getting the best. self-interest but that's a wrong road we ought to think something of ourselves we're to love our neighbor as ourselves we are to love ourselves because you cannot love your neighbor you cannot be a true christian without having a respect for yourself and there's a certain love of self but not this egocentric thing because the very heart of sin is selfishness the very heart of sin is ego and when you come to Christ, your ego has to be surrendered to Christ until he becomes law. And then secondly, not only can you choose your way of life, but you can choose who will be the master of your life. What's going to master your life? What philosophy are you giving your life to? What group are you giving your life to? Who is going to control you? Are you going to control your own life? and make a wreck of it. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. By nature, we want to run our own lives. We think we know better than even God knows. But God has a plan for your life. And his plan is perfect. For every young person here, God has a plan. He has the right person picked out for you to marry if you'd only trust him to help you. He has the right job for you the right vocation for you it's all planned if you'll say lord thy will be done and you surrender to him and let him become involved in all the affairs of your life or some of you that are already married or maybe you're older now and your life is all messed up did you know that god can rearrange your life after you've messed it up by forgiving your sin now he can't take those scars away of sin I've watched people come forward here and I've seen many of them as they stood in front of this platform night after night I've seen them with sin scarred faces because sin leaves its mark but God can forgive all that and he can
take all that mess that you've made in your life and straighten it all out and get you back on the right road if you'll trust him. You say, well, Billy, suppose I've been divorced and my remarried and my life is all, what, what'll happen? Well, you can't unscramble eggs. But you can start from where you are by trusting Christ where you are. He'll forgive the past and give you a whole new spiritual life and give you a power beyond anything you ever dreamed and a love and a joy and a peace. Don't let the devil worry you about past sins once you've been to the cross. If your son asks for bread, will you give him a snake? No, God loves you. He has a plan for you. And you ask for something good, he's not going to give you a snake, says the scripture, said Jesus. The rich young ruler, the problem with him was not his wealth, but he wanted to control his own life. And many of you want to control your own life. You see, we want to run our own lives. Suppose I'd go up in the airliner and tell the pilot, I want to pilot this plane. I've never piloted a plane in my life. I can take over from you. No. God says, get up out of that seat. You're making a wreck of your life. You're heading toward destruction. Let me take the controls of your life. I've been over the road before. Let me help you. And then lastly, you can choose your own destination. The destination is heaven or hell. The Bible says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Narrow is the gate and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. What are we to do? What can you do tonight to make your peace with God? The Bible says prepare to meet God. Well, how do you prepare? First, by repentance. Repentance means that you're willing to let God change your life. It means that you change your mind so much that it changes the way you live. And you're willing to give up all those things that are sinful in your life and turn over to Jesus Christ, your life. The second thing, you come by faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, says the Bible. Just believe. You say, well, there must be a catch somewhere. There is. That word believe means that you put your total confidence in. You don't put your confidence in your own works. You don't put your confidence in anything but the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. You cannot work your way. You cannot pay your way. You come by simple childlike faith. And then... The third thing, you must be willing to be a disciple or a follower of Christ. Earlier in the year, it was my privilege to hold a 10-day mission at Cambridge University in England, as well as Oxford University. And I could not help but remember that young man at Cambridge who made this statement when he gave his life to Christ. He was the son of a very wealthy man, and he was one of the greatest cricketers that Cambridge has ever had. He said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice that I can make for him can be too great. That was C.T. Studd who said that. And he went out as a missionary with the Cambridge Seven that started a whole missionary movement at the end of the last century. Jim Elliott, who was killed by the Orca Indians in South America as a young student, wrote this. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I ask you young and old alike tonight, do you know Christ? Is he your Lord and your Savior? In a few moments, I'm going to ask you to do something very difficult. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform as we saw over 500 last night do. And stand here and say by coming symbolically, I open my heart to Christ. I want him to forgive my sins and change my life. I want to know where I'm going. I want to know what life is all about, and I want fulfillment in my life. I ask you to come publicly because every person Jesus called in the Bible, he called publicly. I ask you to come publicly because there's a psychological and a biblical reason for you to come. You stand here a moment, and after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with all of you and then give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. There's something about coming forward like that that settles it and seals it. You that are in the other auditorium where we were a moment ago, where thousands of people are gathered, 
You come forward in your auditorium where you are. Grady Wilson will be there to say a word and to help you. And many counselors are there as well. And then you that are watching by television, you pick up the phone right now and call the number on your screen. Don't let this moment pass because there may never be another moment quite like this in your life when you're so close to the kingdom of God and all it needs is a, is a phone call to talk to someone. And then if you don't get through immediately, wait a moment or two and call again. Wait five minutes or ten minutes, call again. But don't let this night pass. Those people, some of them will be there for several hours to answer your phone. You get up and come right here as people are making their decisions here and in the other auditorium and all over America right now. You join them and come and stand here and say yes to Christ. We're going to wait on you. You may be in the choir. You may be a leader in the church or you may not have any church connections. Whoever you are, God has spoken to you. Get up and come. We're going to wait on you. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that many scores of people, I suppose hundreds of people, are coming to make this commitment here in Reno, Nevada. You can make that same commitment right now where you are. Just pick up the phone and call that number that's on your screen and have a talk with that counselor and tell them what you want to do or make the decision right where you are. Maybe your circumstances are such you cannot call right now. All right, make your commitment now. Bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelist,